Hi, I'm Kat. So, a few months ago, I was invited to join Big Lang, which is a group of linguistics, conlang, and world building YouTubers. George Corley from the channel Conlang Re organized the Conlang Relay, the 2024 YouTube Conlang Relay, which I participated in. And so, this video is my torch for the relay. How this works is each person gets a text in the previous person's conlang and some grammar notes and translates it into English as well as their own conlang, which is then passed on to the next person. Of course, I participated with my conlang Khop Jam, which won first place in the second cursed conlang circus. I'll be going after Jake from Let's Have a Booba's Bangkash Gu and before Kate the Pan plays Ne Hong. Oh, and if you're looking for the math section of the video, that's in the speeding up the base matrix construction section. Anyway, let's get started. So this is the document that I got, and this is the text that I have to translate. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna first read the document. To summarize, the language Pakashke has a relatively simple phonology, is strongly head final, with SOV, noun postposition, and adjective noun word order, and a lot of suffixes, has ergative absolutive alignment, and uses noun classifiers extensively. So I finished reading the grammar document. So I think we can now start translating it into English. Okay, so what the heck is mukru? So it looks like this, but then the, the tones are wrong. This is mukru. So I don't know if that's like the same thing. Oh wait, no, I see. Oh, it's evocative. I see. Oh wow. Very cool. So anaconda. Uh, fuck, how do you do, how do you do gloss again? Okay, so for this mukru, I think it will be anaconda hyphen bok. Okay, so I looked through the whole document. I could not find what the heck kashto is. So I think I'm gonna go ask Jake to see if maybe they forgot to put in the document or maybe I am just blind. I guess let's continue working on the translation. So what is gusto? What is gusto? Wo, mu wo. Wait, it could be erg as well. Bi tu shpo, ni song o sa shpo. Wo nga, wo nga. Okay, I don't think this makes sense. Okay, or alongside another case marker. Okay. Di bo, ni hu tu something. Okay, what the heck is hu? Ah, here. Ori. Usha. Ah, okay. So this is gonna be a imperfective. No. No, progressive. Ngokma. Wait a minute. Are tearing apart corpses? Tearing. Huh? Usha, Usha, Ngokma. Ah, ni mosakma. Something like this. <laughs> but what's a ni? Well, there's this, there's ani, but then that's, this is not the same as ani. Oh, to see, classifier corpse, green with abs marked noun. Child, but then the child is dead, probably. So, two large rivers were tearing apart a dead child and, eh? but why is it three, eh? Huh? Here? Okay, this doesn't make sense. Ah, okay. Okay, so I think this is probably a case of weak syllable collapse. Africans and fricatives alternate if there's a weak syllable collapse. So, sh becomes ch. And I remember there's a ka, ka cha or something like that in the diction. Okay, so Jake has responded to me saying that this do thing is something plus a second person singular marker o. Oh. So they add a bit more explanation here. So if a verb or a verbal suffix ends with a or u, then it rounds to o. Oh. It's probably something like ta or du and then plus o. Oh. So perfective du. I think that's probably it. Uh, anaconda. You finished planting a forest or something like that. And then this one, I think it's probably the same thing. So you hunt and something, I don't know. <laughs> so I think this force is also probably absolutive. So you have an ergative here. Then 
to this ergative absolutive, but then you have another absolutive. Is this verb causative? So, but I don't see any so here. So it could also be genitive relationship. Forest is genitive for so probably something like knowledge. You hunted and you showed the knowledge of the forest. This is third person though. But this is second. That that's not right. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Huh? Okay, does the person marking agree with the ergative or with the absolutive? I'm a bit confused. Okay, maybe something like the forest revealed knowledge. I think this part is almost definitely correct. Okay, next sentence. You something the large river tearing apart and saw but the rivers don't see. I'm a bit confused. Okay, so this whole thing is like inner clause within this like outer sentence. But then why would this be third person singular? Maybe the person marking for verbs agrees with the absolutive, not the agent. Hmm. <sighs> Second person ergative. Bane of my existence. Okay, next sentence. Only just oto i ku. So I think this is probably like one tooth. So the number comes after the noun. But then here, two people, child. So number comes before the noun. So I guess either is possible, maybe. Only one tooth remains in the mud. Something like that. Okay, what the heck is that? We guang we erivo divo guanta vo tsu popo must tsu divo is again large river kayumu siparan ochiran mu wa ge tsu pokuama parents asked you okay the your large river here I think that's the only like interpretation that makes sense, right? Did the anaconda do this? Do we believe that the large river allows us to cross? Something like that. But then like literally the large river allows the bridge to us. Okay, I'm somewhat confident in this sentence. Okay. Before. This text loves large rivers, huh? Erimo. Inko. So it could be one branch, but I don't think it makes sense. I don't think that's right. Ori. Oh, wait, there's that. Baby's egg, small round things. Escape. Mazungo. Okay, now the translation. The large river says to the parents they were able to escape okay so bushu nguaka dunu ngoska i'm a little bit confused okay so the net really thing that is older men of wise people this is this is my interpretation i don't know if this is correct but okay next sentence aska wa sapiska awu Aquikos, ragukos, ohu. Okay, so if you have a causative reflexive, how's that working, right? It says the agent and patient are the same. So which two are the agent and patient? You know what I mean? This is confusing. Anyway, Zabushpo, Sinakbu, Choya, Matikuikos, Yongwo, Ori, U, Nsa. Ishqui Kbu Kwami Kwi Damn this is a long quote Chi Ha Awu Ho Kiwa Ha Kwi Kos Bitu Kwi Kos Konwa Nyo Yuki Mi Nyo Ha Kwi Kos Yona Sos Kos Tutu Spin Nyo Ha Tu I Ho Ho He yeah, okay, I don't, no idea. What is this? I'll probably ask Jake. Ushiyo. The hail is Ushiyo. Nyo. Diro. Let's just uh, gloss this last sentence first. Vaping. 
u sapi sapu zo na ga nya zo mun wo nya wo tap ni za zo okay so i've lost all this the problems i don't really know what some of these mean yeah let me think about this for like a few hours or something a so jake replied and clarified a few things if the ergative marked noun is first or second person, then the verb agrees with the absolutive marked noun. Otherwise, it agrees with the ergative marked noun. Also, these two words that I couldn't figure out have actually undergone more advanced sound changes, and they've added an explanation in the document. After fixing some errors and polishing the translation, my final English translation of the Bangashka text is... Oh, Anaconda, you have planted a forest. You have hunted and you revealed the knowledge of the forest. You saw the large rivers were tearing apart two children. All that remains is a tooth in the mud. While having a nightmare, the parents ask you, Do the large rivers hear? What has done this? Do we believe that the large rivers allow us to cross the bridge? The large rivers say to the parents, Branches have torn apart the dear children. They are able to escape. A wise fisherman descended. He says this, Everyone learns about the blame of the future. I hope that honor will be done to lessen the pain. I will return in order to prevent children from being torn apart. Tomorrow, everyone will know a new future. Now, I killed the dazzling, sad future. Though I have come to warn you, but because you are not blind, I listen to you. Thus I am saying to you, Y'all diggers, pick up, make a burial using forced dirt. Okay, I'm editing the video now, but now that I look at it, pick up was probably originally dig. Anyway, we can now translate the text into my conlang Khopjam. I explained how Khopjam works in my video for the Cursed Conlang Circus 2, but here's a brief summary. While human languages localize human concepts in morphemes or words, in Khopjam, each human concept is spread out over the entire utterance, and this is achieved through linear algebra. To translate the text into Khopjam, we first construct a case tree, which is a binary tree where Han characters that represent concepts in the text are placed on the nodes of the tree, and the structure of the tree encodes the relationship between the different concepts. Each Han character maps to a concept number, while each node maps to a case number. The concept case pairs can be written as a summary vector, where the case number corresponds to the entry and the concept number is the value at the entry of the vector. The summary vector is multiplied by the base matrix M to get the sentence vector. Each number in the sentence vector corresponds to a middle Chinese syllable, which is then written in Han characters or Dutch-like orthography as the Khopjam translation of the text. To translate out of Khopjam, simply do everything in reverse. However, since the Khopjam video, I've realized that some of the reverse steps have a bit too much ambiguity in practice. There are two major sources of ambiguity, the mapping from concept numbers to Han characters and the mapping from the orthography to middle Chinese syllables. For the first type of ambiguity, remember in the Khopjam video when I said that This also means that early Middle Chinese homophones will have the same concept number. Yeah, it turns out that that creates too much ambiguity if you're not fluent in Khopjam. As Kate is not fluent in Khopjam, I decided to modify the language so that each syllable corresponds to only one character. For the second type of ambiguity, the problem is it's possible that multiple Middle Chinese syllables correspond to the same Sino-Dutch pronunciation and hence the same orthography. You might think that using Han characters for writing the Middle Chinese syllables will solve the problem, but there are some characters that correspond to multiple Middle Chinese syllables. To get an unambiguous orthography, what works is to write both the Han character and the Dutch-like orthography. These changes to the language, plus some refinements to the grammar, constitute Khopjam version 2.0, which we'll be using for this conline relay. So let's translate the text. First, I construct a case tree for each sentence in the text, and then I combine the sentence trees into one big tree while minimizing its depth. Then if I use the Khopjam Python script to convert the case tree into a summary vector and multiply it by the base matrix, I get... Huh, that's taking a long time. So it turns out that constructing the base matrix takes a hell of a long time. The base matrix M of size n by n is equal to negative A transpose A, where the matrix A is constructed using the formula A equals D times I plus B times the inverse of I minus 2 inverse B. Here, I is the identity matrix, D is the diagonal matrix with alternating ones and negative ones, and B is the following matrix, all of size n by n. This n is the dimension of the summary vector, and in the case of our relay text, we have n equals 1515. Also, we're working with the integers mod p for our calculations, where p is the prime number 3877. 
The term that's taking a lot of time to compute is the inverse matrix of i minus 2 inverse b. If these were matrices over real numbers, then I could have used a standard matrix inversion function such as numpy's numpy.linalg.inf to calculate this inverse. But we're working with integers mod p, so I had to write my own Python code to do this. You might know that if you have a real or complex number x, then the infinite series 1 plus x plus x squared, etc. equals 1 over 1 minus x if increasing powers of x converge to 0. Well, you can do the same thing with matrices. If you have a matrix x, then the series i plus x plus x squared, etc. equals the inverse of i minus x if increasing powers of x converge to the 0 matrix. The trick is to notice that b to the n and all higher powers are equal to the zero matrix. So if we substitute in 2 inverse b for x, we get the formula the inverse of i minus 2 inverse b is equal to i plus 2 inverse b plus 2 inverse b squared, etc. We can then also drop all the terms with the power of n or higher. This results in a finite sum that is quite easy to implement, and it was the original algorithm I used to calculate the inverse matrix. Honestly, I was pretty happy with myself when I came up with this formula, but as we've seen, it's absolute dog water. The reason is that multiplying two n by n matrices together takes n cubed multiplications, and we're doing n minus 2 of these matrix multiplications to get the n minus 1 powers of 2 inverse b. This means that the algorithm requires around n to the fourth multiplications, with n equals 1515, that is around 5 trillion multiplications. On my computer, a 1515 by 1515 matrix multiplication takes around 8 seconds to execute, which is around 430 million multiplications per second. That sounds really fast, but running the whole algorithm would have taken around 3.3 hours. Oh, and my dumbass one year ago decided to have the code generate the matrix A twice, so the script would have actually taken around 6.6 .6 hours to run. Yeah, so that's real bad. We want to speed the code up. The first thing I tried was to calculate the finite sum using fewer multiplications. What I noticed was that if we start off with the first two terms, i plus x, then the next two terms, x squared plus x cubed, are the first two terms multiplied by x squared. This means that the sum of the first four terms is equal to i plus x times i plus x squared. We can then multiply by x to the fourth to get the next four terms. So the sum of the first eight terms is equal to i plus x times i plus x squared times i plus x to the fourth. We can continue doing this. Multiplying by another factor i plus x to the k, where k is the next power of 2, doubles the number of terms in the sum. In other words, if we want to sum n terms, where n is the power of 2, then we can write that as a product of log base 2 of n factors. So it takes around log base 2 of n matrix multiplications to calculate all the powers of x, and then another log base 2 of n matrix multiplications to multiply the factors together, for a total of around 2 times log base 2 of n times n cubed multiplications. For n is equal to 1515, this is around 70 billion multiplications, and when I implemented this algorithm and ran it, it only took 171 seconds to run. Good enough. Nah, I can do better. Screw this long ass sum, let's solve for the inverse matrix directly. When working with real valued matrices, inverse matrices are usually calculated using the Gaussian elimination algorithm. I was late to realize this, but we can use basically the same algorithm when working with integers mod p, and so we can invert the matrix i minus 2 inverse b directly. For general n by n matrices, this takes around n cubed multiplications. Lucky for us, our matrix is in particular an upper triangular matrix with ones on the diagonal, which simplifies the algorithm significantly, and we only need around 1 6 n cubed multiplications. For n is equal to 1515, this is now only around 600 million multiplications. At the speed of 430 million multiplications per second, this algorithm should only take around 1.4 seconds. But when I implemented it, it took 26 seconds to run. The reason for this is that our goal is to calculate the matrix A, while Gaussian elimination only gives us the inverse of i minus 2 inverse b. To get A, we still have to multiply by B, then by D, which is two n by n matrix multiplications and this takes 20 something seconds. To be honest, I was content with 26 seconds. That is, until I noticed that in the inverse matrix, the numbers within each diagonal were the same. Isn't that kind of sus? If that's true for all sizes n, it should be possible to take advantage of this pattern and calculate only a fraction of the entries of the matrix. It turns out that matrices with this pattern are called turplets matrices, and in particular, both i and b are upper triangular turplets matrices. 
The great thing about upper triangular turbulence matrices is that adding or multiplying two of them together or taking the inverse of one always results in another upper triangular turbulence matrix. This means that we only need to keep track of their first row, which is an array of dimension n. We can now try to find the first row of its inverse matrix. Let's call the first row of the inverse C and its entries C1, C2, etc. If we try to multiply i minus 2 inverse b with this inverse, we get an expression containing entries of c that should be equal to the top row of their product, which is the identity matrix. For the first entry, we get that 1 times c1 is equal to 1, so c1 is 1. For the second entry, we get 1 times c2 minus 2 inverse times c1 is equal to 0. So c2 is 2 inverse times c1, which is simply 2 inverse. In general, for the kth entry, if k is greater than 2, we get that ck is equal to 2 inverse times ck minus 1 plus ck minus 3 plus ck minus 5, etc. And ending with a c2 or c1 depending on whether k is odd or even. While we could use this sum directly, the trick here is to realize that the expression 2 inverse times ck minus 3 plus ck minus 5, etc. is simply ck minus 2. This means that we can substitute ck minus 2 into the expression for ck to get rid of most of the terms. What we then end up with is the Fibonacci-like recurrence relation ck is equal to 2 inverse times ck minus 1 plus ck minus 2. Each new term only requires one multiplication, which means that calculating all the entries in the inverse matrix only requires around n multiplications. We can extend this method to calculate the matrix A. Recall that A is calculated by A equals D times I plus B times the inverse of I minus 2 inverse B. All the matrices except D are upper triangular triplets, so everything up until the multiplication by D is blazingly fast. Furthermore, D simply consists of alternating ones and negative ones on the diagonal, so instead of matrix multiplying by D, we can simply make alternating rows negative, which is also extremely fast. The result of this is that, using this algorithm, it took only 0.32 seconds to run the Hopjam script on the Conlang Relay Torch text, which is a 75,000 times speed up from the 6.6 .6 hours the original script would have taken. Not only that, but out of the 0.32 seconds, only 0.0094 seconds were spent on constructing the matrix A, which is a 1.2 million times speed up from the original algorithm. That's great. So here's I think the takeaway from this. Sometimes you think you're being clever when solving a problem, but you're just doing something stupid and your code takes 6 hours to run. But when you take advantage of the symmetries and patterns of the problem, you might be able to come up with a brilliant algorithm that runs at only 0.01 seconds. Oh, and deciphering languages can be pretty fun, but also frustrating. Now with the faster algorithm, we can translate the text into Hopjam and get this. Uh, good luck, Kate. To see how Kate translated the text from Hopjam to Neron, check out her video here, and here's the playlist of the entire Conlang relay.